been a lot of talk about clean slates lately, and when I look at the work that's been done, it looks like that the advent of whiteboards is we've lost the technology for cleaning slates. And so we need to sort of look about how to actually do it. And of course, you know, we've got a real problem here in that, uh, let's see, there we go. The internet's facing some really severe problems, just to recap a little bit. Uh, security is essentially non-existent, as you guys well know. Um, the excuse we get is that, well, nobody thought of it when we started out. Kind of an odd thing to say for a military-funded network, wouldn't you? Actually, it's a systematically weak design. We can show that. Router table size is growing exponentially. The excuse is, well, you know, who cares? Memory's cheap. You know, actually, it, it isn't. Router memories are not on Moore's law curves. All right, so back to this, you know. So anyway, so router, the router table size is, is you know, we, we're no longer on the Moore's law curve, and predictions are that router, routers in the core are, the core cost has become unbounded. There's no, you know, and that's all caused by the fact that we don't do multi-homing. Now, you know, well, you know, the excuse again is that, well, not that many hosts need it. No, just all the ones you want to get to. And, you know, again, a military-funded network that doesn't support redundancy? I mean, what, what were they thinking? Um, and actually, it isn't a small number anymore. Recent uh, projections, as of 2006, is there are probably about 10 to the 7th hosts that are going to need to be multi-homed. Each one requires a route in the core router table. We're in big trouble, guys. And that wasn't, you know, and we've got a clue. Oh, yeah, I mean, some of you are sitting out there going, oh, yeah, well, we do multi-homing. Bull. You kludge it. And it doesn't scale. And if you think that's bad, we haven't even thrown in Smart Grid, who wants to, to multi-home every meter. Well, I'll tell you something. One utility has 10 to the seventh meters. So we're in big trouble. Not only that, mobility is cumbersome and doesn't scale. And the reason for that, you know, an excuse is, you know, well, what do you mean? It works. Well, sort of. That's what makes it a good research topic. It's just sort of. You know, actually, um, with only physical addresses, um, it's hard to do relocatable memory, if you know what I mean. And if, actually, this stems from the fact that we don't solve the multi-homing problem. Congestion keeps utilization low. Well, there's great congestion control in TCP, sort of. Well, bandwidth's cheap. I mean, who cares, right? Actually, as any control theory book will tell you, you know, you want to report, you know, you want to put congestion, you know, feedback mechanisms as close to the thing you're trying to control as you can get it. TCP, we put it as far away as we can get it, thus creating the greatest thesis generator ever done because there's always a tweak you can do to get a PhD thesis out of it, and you don't have to solve the problem, and therefore it continues to be a good thesis topic. So this, this, there, there's method to this madness. Quality of service is difficult to do. Well, net neutrality requires that all traffic be treated equally. Um, actually, net neutrality is just their political cover for the fact that they can't figure out how to do this. Um, and notice the fact that I haven't put up here that we're running out of IP addresses. That's because it's not a problem. We'll see that a little later. And if that weren't bad enough, most of the stuff that you believe about the internet is a myth. The internet is an engine of innovation. In a very real sense, the internet has been stagnant since the late 1970s and has done nothing. They've been living on Moore's Law and Band-Aids. Now, there's lots of innovation on top of the Internet, but the Internet itself hasn't done much of anything. The Internet is a decentralized, no one owns the Internet. Bull. It's the same organization as the PSTN. It just doesn't have a sexy name. It's a bunch of networks that people own. The Internet's based on the ARPANET. No, it's not. We threw away the ARPANET technology. The Internet is based on CICLAD. 
Now, you've all heard of Cyclades, so we don't have to go into that. The internet actually is not an internet. It's a catanet. It hasn't been an internet since January 1st, 1983. The internet's a dumb network. Actually, it's not a dumb network. Uh, it keeps maximal state in the network, not minimal. We can talk about that later if you want to. Uh, the internet has decentralized routing. Actually, most ISPs use nailed up routes. Um, IP addresses name the host. No, they name the interface. Uh, IP is the internet protocol. Well, that's what they tell you. Actually, it's the interface protocol. It's not an internet protocol at all, which of course, since it's not an internet, kind of fits, right? Um, actually, there's, actually, none of the mechanisms in IP actually work, including fragmentation. You can ask me about that one later. TCP isn't perfect, but it's good enough. Every design decision in TCP makes matters worse. And the one thing it got right, they destroyed when they created IP. So other than that, it's not such a bad deal. The reality is quite different. If the internet were an operating system, it would be DOS. You guys are working on top of DOS. We don't even have Unix. That's what we've got today, and that's why we're in trouble. So people have been trying to figure this thing out for quite some time. They said, you know, well, you know, finally, around 2000, they began to realize that all was not well. They needed to do something about it. And, you know, if you look at my book, we, we've, you know, got about seven questions we've sort of come up with you know, way back a long time ago. So a decade ago, DARPA funds the New Arc project. All the top minds are going to come up with a new internet architecture. Two years later, they've come up dry. Nada, nothing. About the same time, the National Research Council issues a report that said in part that the insiders, network researchers, had not shown that they had managed to exercise the usual elements of a successful research program, so a back to basics message was fitting. There's a longer one. You know, it must be sobering to be top notch researchers in a field and told you don't know what you're doing. That's basically what they got told. So when DARPA was unwilling to throw good money after bad, they went to NSF to fund Find and Genie. And they haven't come up with an answer yet either. So it's been roughly a decade at this point. They spent millions of dollars, and they still got nothing to show for it. This is an artisan's response, I think, to what, you know, to do with something. You know, they, what do we do? Well, we build something, right? You know, so they've been looking off. Actually, their guiding principles aren't much help either. Look at this, soft state, hard state. Well, as we'll show today, all properly designed protocols are soft states. So this is a, this is a non-distinction. Loc ID split has been the answer to the uh, addressing problem if you read all the papers. However, you know, the, the theory here is that, you know, we've overloaded the IP address with location and identifier information. Guys, in computer science, all identifiers locate and all locators identify. It's a false distinction. Um, and it continues to route to the wrong place. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. Bait sharing, that really doesn't tell you much of anything. It's just a rug to, to, to sweep things under. The, oh, the God, the, the God of the internet here, the, the, the Bible of the internet, the end-to-end -end principle, at best it's a lemma, more it's a statement of desire, and if anything, it's an impediment to finding a way forward. Um, you can actually show that the end-to-end -end principle, which was written to argue for a transport protocol over a connectionless network, actually implies that circuit switching is best. Now, what do you call a principle that both you know, implies X and not X. We either call it a contradiction or we call it a religion. Take your choice. So the, the, actually the myths and the principles are the major bar barrier to finding an answer. 
The field is no longer a science but a craft. The place where these guys went wrong was they asked what to build rather than asking what don't we understand. The answer has been clear since the mid-90s, and it's actually very simple. Networking is inter-process communication and nothing but inter-process communication. Now, to see this, Cyclade had shown the way. Back in 1972, the first datagram switching network was Cyclade, had the architecture that looked like this, one you've seen often. This sort of laid out the general direction of where we wanted to go. And so we went with it. And we came up with, you know, as we tried to, you know, work it out, you know, that along about 1978, we proposed the OSI model. You know, it was still a little early, and, you know, we, we had felt pretty good about these, these lower four layers here, um, you know, network transport. They, that seemed to be working out pretty well for us by 78. We weren't too sure of what these upper layers were, but Charlie Bachman had said, what about session presentation application? Well, well okay, fine, let's, let's see what happens. So through the 80s, we were developing this, but as we got further and further into it, it started getting a little more complicated, right? And we ended up with something that looked like this. You know, the data link layer divided into Mac and LLC, we figured out that the network layer was actually three sub-layers, sub-network access, sub-network dependent convergence, sub-network independent. Transport stayed where it was, and we actually figured out that the upper three layers were one layer. This we had figured out by about 83. Okay, and we, in fact, we adjusted it. It used to be the clueless test in OSI. If you implemented the upper three layers as three separate layers, you were clueless. You know, <laughs> that, was, that was the game we... So, you know, we, we sort of had figured this out, but it still wasn't working quite right. It didn't feel right. There was something wrong here. Of course, you know, we knew it wasn't quite the full answer. Of course, the Internet never got past this. You know, and so by, by, the, end of the, by the beginning of the 90s, the question had come down to, like, okay, there's something here we're missing. So what is it? And I had been thinking about this, you know, I'd been in charge, I'd been the rapporteur of the OSI reference model, and so, you know, I had sort of got to see all the arguments. And, you know, you, you know and of course when you're a rapporteur, that just means you get to herd cats, right? You don't get to do what you want. But you get to see a lot of stuff. So I started making some notes, and again, I started trying to figure out what it was I didn't understand. And I started to see some patterns I hadn't seen before. So, you know, at one point, after I had sort of put together some of these patterns, and a friend of mine asked me a question about protocols, and I didn't like the answer I'd given her. And I kept thinking about it. I thought, you know, I could do this little exercise for teaching that would really explain all this. Now, guys, sit back. I'm going to take you through a little short exercise. We could make this a lot longer, but I'm going to briefly take you through an exercise. And you're going to say, oh, my God, I know all this stuff. You do. But bear with me, because I think you'll see some things turn up not quite where you expect them to. Okay? And so basically, I says, we've got to go back to basics. One of my professors always told us, look at things from the point of view of the organism, not the observer. Let the problem tell you what the answer is. So let's go back and think about what's going on here. I said, all right, let's start with two processes in the same computer exchanging messages. How does it work? Explain it. Right? Okay, fine, we can do that. So then, what happens if we have two processes in two different computers? What went away? What do I have to add to fix it? Okay, well, Turns out, the first thing you need is you need to be able to figure out if, if the guy you're looking for, the application you want, is on the other machine. First thing you need is management. Of course, in order to do that, you need to be able to do data transfer. And so now you need some kind of error and flow control protocols, because we know as soon as we start to send stuff between machines, you know, 
bad stuff can happen, right? So, you know, okay, so we need that, all right? But now what happens if I have more than two applications in two machines? Ah, well, the first thing I'm going to need is some way to identify which messages go with which flows. They're going to which place, right? So I'm going to have to add. And then I've got, lo and behold, multiple users of a single resource. Hey, that, that's an operating system problem. I know about that one, right? Okay, so we're going to have to have that. Hmm, interesting. So, okay, we're, we're skipping here. I can do this in great detail. But then we go to communicating between end systems, the brute force approach. Okay, what do we need here? Well, actually, we can take th this scheme and we say, well, we need one of these for each wire. Okay, so let's organize it a bit, all right? And so we'll say, okay, we have one of those for each wire, and, you know, we really don't want every, you know, the application to have to figure out which wire he's going to use, so we'll throw something in here that figures out which wire to use. Okay? All right, well, that's nice. But, you know, we know that running a direct wire between everything is just not going to fly, right? That's, that's just too much. You know, that's going to be way too expensive. So let's try and do it on the cheap, right? And so now we need routers. And, um, you know, and then if, if I take this in the, uh, the big case, you know, you can say, well, we'll have to dedicate some to routing. We'll have to have add addresses here. Um, oh, by the way, we can have congestion from time to time, so we're going to have to add another level of error and flow control to catch, you know, to handle the uh, loss due to congestion. You know, and if we do all that, and I can go through it in great detail to show you how all that takes place, you end up with this. Voila! Great! You're sitting there going, well, big deal, Day. You just re-derived the lower four layers. Where's the progress in that? Ah, but I didn't. What I found was that I had created a repeating pattern. There aren't seven layers or five layers. There's one layer and it repeats. All layers do the same thing, they just do it for a different part of the problem. This is a vastly different model. This says a lot of things. Okay? Actually, I have to tell you something. I, I wrote this. I told you, I wrote it as a teaching tool. Got up from my desk, walked away, and I was suddenly angry as hell. Right? I had just gone through an exercise that any of us could have gone through in the last 30 years and solved the problem. What a bunch of idiots we've been. Especially me. <laughs> I mean, don't you love it when the problem hoists you on your own petard? <laughs> You know, I mean, talk about, you know, well, anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> so, you know, this is kind of cool. So let's see what happens here. Basically, what we have here is a distributed IPC facility that does IPC. And actually, we should have seen it sooner. If we go back here, look, it was staring us in the face. But there was a repeating pattern here. But we were so con concentrating on the differences, we didn't see the similarities. Okay? So the implications are networking is IPC and only IPC. Actually, we have always believed this. This is the other thing that makes it mad. Back, we've always said the reason the ARPANET succeeded, some of you won't like this, is because it was built by operating system guys, not telecom guys. 
And there are, you know, I, I used to, I was telling this to young professors in the U.S. Whereas a friend of mine says, you know, it's really bad when senior professors are a lot younger than you are. Uh, <laughs> and he came across, there was a, there's a paper by Bob Metcalf on writing network control programs, which is the predecessor to TCP that was in the ARPANET. And in the middle of the paper somewhere, Bob says, networking is inter-process communication. He says, you're right. You guys did think about it like that. I said, well, of course we did. How else are we going to do it? So all layers have the same function, you know, uh, with different scope. Not all instances of, of layers uh, need to have all functions, but, you know, you don't need any more. Now, one of the things that's really important here, and I, this is just really mid, brought home to me by some stuff that's going on re, right now, you guys have been taught that layers are, you do a function, for modularity, you do a function, once you've done it, you don't have to repeat. That may be true in some cases. It's not true in networks. In fact, the primary characteristic of layers in networks is shared, distributed shared state of a given scope. Scope of the shared state is critical. Okay, you've got to keep that in mind. Um, so, you know, a, a layer is a distributed application that performs and manages IPC. It's a distributed IPC facility. This yields a theory and an architecture that scales indefinitely. Yeah, physics imply, Im, imposes some limits, but the architecture does not. Now, before we get really get into to looking at the architecture, there are a couple other tools we need here. Uh, I'm going to skip over the connection, connectionless one. One, we're going to talk about applications a bit and the nature of applications. We're going to talk about Dick Watson's stuff and the nature of protocols, and then a little bit about naming and addressing. The first thing we want to talk about is the nature of applications. Now, the early ARPANET, we didn't worry too much about this problem, uh, and we didn't really need to. I mean, again, we were using operating systems for our guides, so we did the obvious first three applications, right? Telnet, FTP, and remote job entry. You were going to say mail. No, no, it's remote job entry. Mail was two commands in FTP. Now, by 1985, when we were doing the OSI thing, we came up with a problem. Now, you're going to, and actually, I kind of like this for this reason. This is one of the few cases where you're going to say, oh, my God, this is a lot of pedantic garbage I've ever heard. You know, we had a turf problem. We're doing the OSI model and all this esoteric stuff and it's saying, where is the application? Is it inside OSI or outside of OSI? Now, this sounds about as useful as hits on a bore, right? So, what do you, you know, came up partly because, you know, there are other things in ISO besides communications. There's, you know, banking and health and all this stuff. And were there applications in the OSI environment, so we were all in one committee, or was it outside? It was a turf battle thing, right? This is one of the few cases where I actually seen politics yield a major technical insight. This was kind of cool. So we had this problem. You know, where were the applications? Were they inside OSI or outside of OSI? The other problem we had with this one was we didn't have any short title for this problem that we could use in minutes because the only one we had was obscene. This was known as the balls in, balls out problem. Okay? And the answer turns out, and when I first heard it, I thought, oh my gosh, not another standards committee wimp out. The answer turns out to be the balls are on the line. Whoop-de-doo. Actually, it turns out this is the right answer. It turns out, and what's really cool about this is we, we did this like five years before we get the first example, which is the web. It turn, you know, what you've got here is that there's a part of every application that deals with the communications. This is what OSI called the application entity. The rest of it is what deals with the application. So what you can think of this is, you know, the application entity, which is inside the OSI environment, and why am I having, 
So there, okay. Is here, think of that as the protocol. Now think about in terms of the web. You're going to use HTTP. Oh gosh. Anyway, you're going to use HTTP. But you don't care about getting to HTTP. You want to get to CNN.com. Right? That's the application. Okay? So you've got to, you know, you need to have both. And we hadn't, you know, when we were doing Telnet and FTP and all that stuff, you know, the application and its use was one and the same thing. So we didn't see this distinction. And so now what you see is that you can have multiple application entities. I mean, think about it as the application is, say, a hotel reservation, and you use HTTP to get to the user, and you might use a remote database protocol to get to do the updates and stuff. And so you have two different application entities, you might have multiple instances of them. Okay? Again, it's esoteric, but it turns out to be a really you know, important distinction. And it's key for all of this. However, as we thought about all this, and as you guys have probably seen, there's really only needs to be one application protocol. Okay, well, think about it. What can you do remotely? I contend that there are only six things you can do remotely. Create, delete, read, write, start, stop. On objects. Everything else is outside the protocol. Everything else is in the objects. Basically what that case is, you know, well, in that case, you're probably going, well, okay, Day, you just went through this whole big thing about application entities, and now you're saying that it's all one. What's the big deal? Well, actually, what you're saying is a particular collection of, of objects, you know, is required for some activity. You're doing something about access control. One protocol, potentially shared objects, different state machines, hence all application protocols are stateless. The state is in the application. The next thing we need comes about, again, another old result from Dick Watson and Delta T, um, which I'm sure you were taught in all your beginning computer science co uh, networking courses. 1980, Dick uh, takes a unique approach to designing a transport protocol. He assumes that all connections exist all the time. That transmission control blocks are merely caches of state that we've, that we've seen traffic on recently. Watson proves that the necessary and sufficient conditions for synchronization is to bound three timers. That's all you need to do. No explicit state synchronization, no hard state is necessary. You don't have any traffic for 2MPL? Throw the TCB away. Who cares? Not going to hurt anything. Sends and fins are completely and utterly unnecessary. This creates a far simpler and more robust protocol than what we're using today. In other words, all properly designed protocols, designed data transfer protocols, are soft state. And um, this shows that you know, TCP actually has all these uh, timers and more and actually do, it ends up getting in the way and it actually doesn't do as good a job. We've got a paper on that. Um, and basically then from the stuff we've been doing, we figured out that if you separate mechanism and policy in protocols, now when I say mechanism, I mean things like act and flow control being mechanism. Policy being when you act and flow control. I mean, one of my favorite examples is, uh, you know, we always thought we'd do a different version of transport for voice because you care about order but you don't care about gaps. Then I realized that no, we don't need another version of the protocol, we just change the act policy. You lie. 
There's nothing in these protocols that says you have to tell the truth. You know, you get a gap, you don't care about it. You send an act anyway. Who's going to know? Right? Which also told me that we had the semantics of act wrong all this time. Act doesn't mean I got it. Act means I'm not going to ask you to retransmit. That's a big difference. So I went through the exercise of separating mechanism and policy in a protocol just to see what would happen. And what turns out is that there are two kinds of mechanisms. There are tightly bound mechanisms, like CRC checking, sequencing, that have to be with the transfer PDU. Can't put it anywhere else. And then there, is, you know, and in those policies imposed by the sender, then there are loosely bound mechanisms where the stuff that's associated with it could be in the transfer PDU, but doesn't have to be. Flow control and ACK. And those policies imposed by the receiver. The interesting thing is that when you do this, and you look at how they're implemented, you see that the two pieces barely communicate. They're very loosely coupled. Basically, this says that we split TCP in the wrong direction. We split it horizontally, we should have split it vertically. And if you take the, the, the note that the syntactic differences here are minimal, I mean, you know, most of the stuff are fixed fields for port IDs and addresses and control bits of various forms. The only thing that really varies is the sequence number, and all you're doing there is varying the modulus of the arithmetic. So what's the big deal about syntax? So we can conclude that there's really only one data transfer protocol with a small number of encodings, and we can plug in policy. So the implications for protocols is that data transfer protocols modify state internal to the protocol. Application protocols modify state external to the protocol. In other words, the only time that, that the data transfer state data transfer protocol modifies state is the coordination between those two halves, and really all that the, this side ever does is turn on and off a couple of cues. There are only two protocols: an app, a database protocol or a data transfer protocol based on delta T, an application protocol that can perform this, the six operations on objects. There's no distinct protocol like IP. You don't, you know, well, you could put one in, but it just merely makes the implementation slower. So, I mean, you know, unless you, that's what you need, I, would, I wouldn't bother. Um, a layer provides IPC to either another layer or to a distributed application. And the thing is now, if you look at the what we're doing with the application protocol, we're making a transition from an IPC model to, of the world to a programming model. That application protocol is really providing a, quote, assembly language for distributed applications. Okay. And then Watson comes along and says, I mean, the real thing that we're taking from Watson, besides the fact that we've got a much simpler protocol, is that we need to decouple port allocation from synchronization. This is the key thing that's in his, his results. This is why you can say that all connections exist all the time. That actually tends, uh, turns out to have some really major implications and implies for security. And then there's one other thing that comes out of Watson. He defines what networking is. You can essentially conclude from, from what he's proved that if you can't bound maximum packet lifetime, it's not IPC. If you can't bound maximum packet lifetime, then it must be remote storage. Now, the other problem we've got, the, probably the worst problem in the network today, is addressing. And the root cause of all of the Internet's addressing problems goes back to the ARPANET and the IMPs. You know, I always tell people that my original network address was 12. In the ARPANET, your host address was your IMP port number. We were the 12th IMP on the net. Okay, 
Now, remember, no one had ever built a packet switch network before, so we had a lot of problems to deal with. The esoterics of naming and addressing were way down on our list. You know, about the first 10 were, how do we pass packets? Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was not that easy in those days. Um, you know, we had these really high-speed lines, and they were. We could hardly keep, we couldn't, we couldn't saturate them. 56 KB was just blow, blow you away. But even so, it didn't take us long to realize we had a problem. 1972, Tinker Air Force Base joins the net, says, we want to have redundant connections to the network. Remember my boss came in and told me this. I went, oh yeah, good idea. Oh, it's not going to work. Why not? Well, your host address is your imp port number. To the net, if you have redundant connections to the network, it looks like you are two different hosts. There's no way for the network to know that those two wires go to the same place. This is the moldy homing problem. Well, I'm an OS guy. I know the answer to this problem. I need a virtual address space over the physical address space, right? I need to name the node, not the interface. Well, that's, that's easy. We can deal with that. Um, it's 40 years later, and we have yet to deal with this. And if you really want to see this, take a look at Salzer. There's a, there's a famous paper everyone talks about naming and addressing. And Salzer being a good OS guy, but he didn't quite get it right. He says that, you know, well, we've got the standard things in networks that we have in operating systems. We have application name to virtual address to physical address, and then we route into the hardware, which is what you do in an OS. Okay, and so he said, well, we have, in networks, we have an application name, a node address, a point of attachment address, and then the root. Okay, so he strictly follows the operating system model. But wait a minute. Networks aren't like operating systems. In a network, I can have more than one wire between the same two next hops. That says that the application node, there's a node for a mapping from the application name to the node address, what we'd usually call a directory lookup. Roots then have to be a sequence of node addresses. Then we need to have the node to point of attachment mapping to pick which wire that we use between next hops. It's a two-stage process. Okay, but notice something. That last mapping here and here are the same mapping. They're a mapping between names to address, you know, to, to the layer below of nearest neighbors. Gee, a repeating structure. How odd. You know, it was staring us in the face again. Of course, there's an easier way of looking at this. If you go back and remember that layers are locuses of shared state, what we're basically saying here is that one should route on the address where you're doing the relaying. Well, duh. Where else would you do it? Well, not where the internet does it. So basically what we have in the internet is point of attachment addresses. Basically IP addresses and MAC addresses name the same thing. We have no node addresses. And at best, application names are macros for, or which is we have like URLs, are macros for jump points in low memory. Well, now, there's a level of sophistication I haven't seen in probably 35, 40 years. Uh, 
Okay. Now we're ready to take a look at what this repeating structure implies. Notice what happens when we do this. We take our protocols and we notice that they de naturally decoupled into tightly coupled and loosely coupled. Right? Here we have SDU protection, CRC, encryption, whatever you want to do, relaying and multiplexing, handling of, of the sequencing and reassembly stuff, delimiting. That's decoupled through a state factor for IPC control, ACK and flow control, which is decoupled further for management, layer management autonomic purposes. This is exactly the kind of structure you want to see fall out. You have essentially three time scales decoupled from each other through some kind of state vector. This runs very fast, this runs a little slower, this runs slower yet. Computation here is fairly straightforward, here is a little bit more complex, and here it gets fairly complex. Notice we didn't have to invoke any principles. The problem just did it by itself. First of all, I like that. I'm lazy. Second of all, it's, of course, a good indicator you're on the right track. <laughs> right? So, you know, this is kind of neat. You're seeing, you're seeing the right kind of stuff here. Not only that, but out of this, you end up with three kinds of systems. If the thing is recursive, we're going to have hosts, we're going to have your traditional looking router, you're going to have what I call a border router that drops down a level, but I still am routing across here as well as down here. And notice, depending on how you want to look at it, NATs are either everywhere or nowhere in this architecture. And middle boxes? We don't need no stinking middle boxes. So we've got something here we can actually work with. And also notice that while the architecture says it's a repeating structure and you can have any number of layers, notice that no one box is going to have any more layers than it has now because you're, you're recursing. Okay? Now, Hosts might actually have some specialized diffs on them. I actually think there's some interesting things here where, that, that follow along here where you, you might end up with some other diffs that do a VPN or do, uh, for example, error and flow control is really just another form of two-phase commit. So I think, I think we can see some other things get built up on top. And who knows what we might find when we start to do distributed applications. This opens up a world of distributed applications we haven't been able to think about. So how does it work? How would you join a layer? Now see, this is another interesting thing. Joining a layer actually falls out of the model. Well, you know, rule number one, do what the problem tells you. Don't try and make it up. We're real bad at making things up. Listen to the problem. So the problem says, I've got an application process, and it wants to talk to some other application process for the purpose of joining a layer. Okay, so what does it do? Well, he must set up an application connection from one application to another through an underlying communication media, an N minus one diff in this case, which eventually gets to be a wire, right? First thing he does is a authenticates B, and if we'd gone through the IPC model in great detail, we would have seen that that was one of the, the first steps you did. Okay, so A authenticates B says, "Are you allowed to be in this? Are you allowed to join this thing?" Well, yeah, okay, you can come in here. At which point he initializes him, assigns him an address, and basically that address now is a synonym whose scope is only within the diff, only known within the diff. It might be structured to make it useful in, inside the diff. So, you know, basically joining a diff is no big deal. We just do what the problem says. So how do we set up a connection? How do we do IPC? Well, now we do the same thing. What's, what does the problem tell us to do? Well, 
AS IPC to allocate communication resources to B. First thing A, you know, the guy, the diff at A has to do, the IPC process at A has to do is figure out where the heck B is. Okay? So he determined, you know, so he looks at his local table and ah, I ain't got no B here. So I asked whoever I'm supposed to ask. Since B's not located to A, so he goes, takes his search rules, and he goes off to find B. He says, keeps on looking, he says, ah, look over there. Now, if this were DNS, you'd get an entry for B and you'd immediately report back. But that's not what the IPC model tells you to do. The IPC model says, go to B. Hey, is you there? Am I allowed to talk to you? Oh, yeah, okay. Now I report back. Notice what I just did. A, I really know he's there. If he's not there, I keep looking. You go to DNS and somebody says, oh, it's, here's the address, and he's out of date, you're up a creek until DNS updates. If you just follow the model, it tells you what to do. Okay. And he can also re return the port allocations and everything, so you can start a Delta T connection because you've already allocated the ports because we've decoupled out port allocation from synchronization. So what do we know about addresses from this, from this architecture? Well, as I just said, an address turns out to be a synonym for an application process name or an IPC process name. The relation of node and point of att attachment in a recursive architecture is relative, hence it's irrelevant. Uh, a layer roots on its address, well, big deal. Since the address is structured to facilitate its use within the layer, it must be assigned by the layer. If you think about it, that addresses are location dependent. Now, this is an odd concept for you guys. Living in Europe, you guys don't know about how we use addresses. Okay? One of the things I always say about the way we did it at BBN, they screwed it up because they're from Boston, because Boston's like Europe. Right? Addresses are just place names. See, now, in God's country, where I come from, in the Midwest, we live as God meant us to on a grid. <laughs> now, on a grid, you can do real addressing. <laughs> and, you know, and you can actually, you know, and actually I realized that in New England, when I go to find something, I do it like the Internet does routing. I, I get my map out, and I figure out where the destination is, and I trace my route back, and I figure out where to go next. When I'm going someplace in the Midwest, that's not what I do. I look at the address, and I say, hmm, it's off over there. And I head in that direction, and I watch other addresses as I go. And I sort of hone in on the address. Very different kind of thing. So, you know, we, now we got, a, we got a place where we can actually start to think about doing that. Um, oh, one of the th rules that came out of this, and this came out really early in the 80s, but I still see it being done. Never form an address by concatenating an N minus one address with an N address. Okay, it sounds natural, right? Well, we'll just, you know, it's like doing file names, right? Well, that tells you why you shouldn't do it. What do we call file names that are constructed this way? We call them path names. You're constructing a path through the stack. We've got moldy homing to deal with. The last thing we want is a path. The path is what we're trying to avoid. So embedding, you know, don't do something stupid like... Um, Embed a MAC address in an IPv6. Who would do it? Who would do that, right? Nobody would be that dumb, right? So, you know, we've got all sorts of stuff going on here. Um, so now, basically, with a recursive model, we end up with we, 
separate layer, addresses in each layer. If we've done the address assignment topologically, okay, i.e. In, in the vein of the Midwest, then I can actually bound router table size. Because really, when you think about it, I, have to, I, may, I may have weirdness here, and I have to route in the normal way across here, but once I get here, I know where those guys are. I don't need that route. So I only have to compute routes from here to here and from here to here. Not only that, but the routes from here to here are down here. They're not in these tables. So I can play all sorts of games. I can really make things scale. Not only that, but mobile homing falls out for free. Well, I'm routing on node addresses, not points of attachment, so what's the big deal, right? You know? You get the structure right, multi-homing comes along for free. Not only that, but mobility is just dynamic multi-homing. All I'm doing is changing points of attachment. Or you could look at it as, you know, points of you know, changing points of attachment with planned failures. <laughs> I mean, actually, if you think about it, multi-homing is the same as mobility, it's just that the failures happen more often in mobility. Right? Not only that, but think about the problem of changing an address. You know, in mobility, one of the things you want to do is keep the address topological so that it's still relevant for routing to make it help. That means you may have to change addresses on the fly. All right? How do you do that? I mean, that's always one thing that just has always driven us crazy because, you know, oh crap, how do you change addresses without losing the connection? All right? Well, think about it. An address is a synonym for an IPC process. You want to change addresses? Assign a new synonym. On all the return traffic, use the new one. Everybody who's talking to you starts using that address. You start advertising it in routes. It starts to propagate. Over time, you just let the old addresses die off. What's the big deal? Nobody's the wiser. Not only that, but because you've got a recursive architecture, down at the bottom of the architecture, near the base stations and stuff, where things are changing quickly, you have small scope. So you have less to update. As you go up, scope gets bigger. You have more things to update, but you change less often. You, again, you've got exactly the kind of mesh you want. So, um, let's see. Oh, now there's another inlet. Remember, and I, you know, we skimmed over the IPC model real fast, but I, I threw up this thing when I was doing the IPC model to go from, you know, to in, in systems talking to each other. This one's got a really interesting implication. And this is what's really neat about these kinds of models. This thing existed here for two years before, you know, you know, I can be really slow sometimes, you know? I mean, dumb as a rock. You know, finally hits me one day, you know, that the user didn't have to see it. We did this because the user didn't have to see all the wires, right? Well, he shouldn't have to see all the networks either. This means that you don't need a global address space. Boy, now did that take me aback. I didn't expect that result to come out. Okay? We can have an interdiff directory. I got a bunch of layers under me. Right? Guy asks to talk to some application. He's not in that layer, he's not in that layer. You know, I got that little application there trying to figure out which layer to use. Huh, not any of the layers I have. Ask my neighbor. Have you seen a layer, a diff, who supports this application? Oh yeah, it's over here. Oh, and by the way, you've got an N-1 diff that underlies that one. 
Oh, good. I'll just join that diff. Okay? Or, maybe not. Maybe there isn't anybody. So the guy who says, oh, it's over there, says, oh, well, then maybe what we'll do is we'll create a new diff that spans you, me, and him, and now you can talk to him. This is how you generate diffs and how the network, you know, essentially creates itself. You don't need a global address space. IPv6 has been a waste of time twice. That, that comes from somewhere else, but we'll see. And actually, if you stop and think about it, that probably means that 32 or 48 bits is probably more than enough for any diff that you'd want to do. Because what you're really doing here, you know, oh, the other, the other implication of this, which is a little scary, which is you don't need a global address space either. Right? In fact, you can do this today, and people do do it today. Basically, what is the scope of the application name? And people will tend to say, well, it's global. No. The scope of an application name is defined by the chain of directories you can look in. If you have non-intersecting chains of directories, you can have independent, non-global application namespaces. And you say, well, that's not terribly useful. I could have it in. Well, that depends on you, how you answer the question, useful to who? Well, I can't get to everybody. Maybe I don't want you to get to this. Like I said, it, this one's a little scary. But, again, you have to recognize it. Neither a global address space nor an application namespace needs to be global. What does this say about congestion control? Well, you remember I took a swat at congestion control earlier because we put it in TCP. Partly because we didn't know how to put it down below without getting it up with hop-by-hop -hop congestion control. You know, and if you think about it, and this is the part that's really scary, conge TCP congestion control may be one of the fatal flaws in TCP, or in the internet. The effectiveness of any congestion control algorithm is directly related to the time to ch effect change. In other words, the, the larger the diameter of the network, the slower you're going to be able to react, the less effective it's going to be. By putting it in TCP, we've made sure it's as long as possible. Not only that, but because we've made it implicit notification, it's predatory. If I try and do something down below here with congestion control, it's going to respond faster. But TC, excuse me, TCP congestion control is implicit. It's going to detect it anyway, and it's going to respond slower. Consequently, no matter what I do down below, I got somebody working against me up above. I'm going to look like crap. It ain't going to work well. In other words, there ain't no, and I, I, don't, really see that there, I don't really see that there's any way out of this. I don't know how you do it. But in this model, I could put congestion control in a lot of places. I could put it on the edges. I can put it between here you know, as, as you know, you know, um, entrance uh, access control. Uh, I can put it across the holes. Lots of things. Which ones should we do? Ah, it's got to be a ton of PhD theses in there for you someplace, right? And, you know, not only that, but this gives us a way of organizing ISPs so that they can better control their resources. You know, one of the things that we believe that you see, should see happen when you, especially with connectionless networks, as you go down toward the backbone, tra traffic should become more deterministic and more connection-like. And so we ought to be able to do that with using the, this with the recursion. 
and essentially have different kinds of resource allocation po policies as we now negotiate down. Not only that, but the question always comes up, well, so how does the public internet fit in this? Well, the public internet is just a layer that floats on top. It's like an electronic mall. Or as I always like to say, it's an electronic mall in the seedy part of town. You know, you gotta watch out for pickpockets and thieves and drug dealers and, you know, all sorts of nasty people. You know, uh, but of course, that also means that you don't necessarily have to have one e-mall. You could have upscale e-malls which were safe or dedicated to specific things. You know, you, I mean, yeah. You could really have an internet. What a, what a, what a revolutionary idea. And, of course, you know, this also has the, uh, from a user's perspective, this actually has another interesting result. You're sitting at home on your network, there are different emails, you get to choose which network you join. Or if you join any network, unlike today, you can go home and close the door. Okay, so when you join, what happens is you also have a choice as whether your network joins, your host joins, or your browser joins. You can, you can regulate your level of exposure. It just falls out of the model. How does security work? Well, one, first thing you notice right off the bat is we get security by isolation. You know, addresses in here are completely unavailable to the host. You can't see it, you can't attack it. No user hacker uh, can compromise ISP assets unless the ISP is phys physically, you know, compromised. The other thing that's interesting about this, this is another thing where you, doing the model carefully is important. When I did this model, I gave security absolutely, positively no thought. Okay? I ignored it entirely. I know everybody's going to tell you you shouldn't do that. I did it. However, this model tells you where it should go. Okay? Diff is a, turns out to be a securable container. The diff is secured not by each component separately, as we're doing with the internet today, but remember, an application only knows the destination application name and his local port ID. He never sees an address. He has no need to. Step one, when applications talk to each other, the application destination uh, must ensure that the destination is who it purports to be, and so the applications authenticate each other. It's part of what applications should do. All right, how much you want authentication you do? That's your problem. But the applications do it, and as we saw, when you join a diff, you're an application, you do it. All members of the diff are authenticated by policy. We, we do the, uh, remember how we did the connection setup? We do access control at the other end, if you want to see that. So we've got authentication. We've got joining the diff is authenticated. When you go to set up a connection, you go to the other side and say, hey, you there? Am I allowed to talk to you? We've got access control. The model tells you where it goes. If you don't trust the stuff, we have SDU protection at the bottom encrypts everything, because of the way it's done, because of the way the protocols were, were separated, you know, factored out, there's no need for anything like IPSEC. It falls out for free. The only thing you have to trust the lower layer for is that he will send, he will deliver something to somebody. That's as far as you have to go. Not bad for not thinking about it. You know. And, you know, so security, a hacker in the public internet cannot connect to an application in another diff without either joining the diff or creating a new diff spanning both of them. 
um, this is going to make botnets real hard. I mean, you may get in, you may get in but you're going to have a hard time getting back out if you're not already a member. So how do we get there? Well, this is the part where every guy goes, oh, okay, here comes the bad news. He's described an entirely new architecture, completely rethinks the whole thing. He's talking about a forklift upgrade, right? Actually, that's the kind of the best part. You don't need to. Right? We said the public internet was just a diff that floats over the top. So, there is no transition. There's only adoption. When repeating structures, you know, we can operate over, under, or around. In fact, what we're building right now is the interdiff directory so that you have a common interface. You can talk to stuff that are on a diff. You can join the diff. And then we can take the new stuff and push it down invisibly and build more you know, sophisticated applications up. You know, we have a Reno sockets converter that, so we can move ab legacy applications without any change. Now, there are going to be some things you can't do. Um, you know, for example, uh, applications that exchange IP addresses probably going to be a little dicey. But then, you know, any application that exchanges IP addresses is poorly designed in the first place. I've always said that, you know, exchanging IP addresses in an application is like moving, you know, passing physical memory pointers in a Java program. You know, you wouldn't do it there. Why are you doing it here? You know. So, um, and the way I look at it is, if this isn't advantageous to you, don't use it. If it's advantageous, use it. Now, I personally think it's going to be pretty advantageous. You know, use it for uh, its adv advantages. Don't use it if you don't need to. If you want to support a few hundred RFCs, constantly patch it, uh, ongoing cyber warfare, lousy congestion control, complex protocols, use the internet. Right? You want security, high performance, simple operations, scaling, lower costs, lower headaches. Well, start thinking about Reno. So if it's not an advantage to you, don't bother. You can live on top of the public internet for as long as you want. And there's a lot more. I, I, we've barely scratched the surface here. I mean, I, I've been rattling on here for way too long. And, you know, told you all sorts of stuff. But I'm sure that there's tons of stuff here we haven't seen yet. So um, jump in and have a little fun with this. Okay? Questions? Okay.